Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining us on a on a lovely sunny evening. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, so, yeah, as Rachel said, my name's Chris, and I am the archive specialist, uh, normally based at Norfolk Heritage Centre um, when we're open. Um, but as you can see, currently based um, in in our spare room. Um, yeah, so normally I work very closely with Rachel um, in the Norfolk Heritage Centre, um, making our collections work, um, doing school visits, educational visits, events, um, the kind of thing we're doing this evening. Um, and uh, just before I sort of kick off with the, the sort of get into the main event, just to give a very, very brief sort of overview of what we hold, because obviously I do hope, well, I, I suspect some of you uh, are already regular customers uh, of, of, the, of the Heritage Centre in the past, but obviously I do hope those of you who haven't um, ventured into the Heritage Centre before do so when we are once again open. Um, I'm technically employed by Norfolk Record Office, so um, a good way of thinking of the, the Heritage Centre, just to give you a bit of a, an introduction if you're not familiar with it, is to think of it in relation to the, to the Record Office um, in terms of the collections that we both hold. So Norfolk Record Office, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, is down next to uh, County Hall and Mart Martineau Lane. It's part of the Archive Centre along with the uh, East Anglian Film Archive and the Norfolk Sound Archive. And the Norfolk Record Office holds um, roughly 20 million um, original records. So original archive material relating to the history of Norfolk. So uh, things like um, uh, letters, diaries, parish registers, indenture records, local authority records, school log books, the list goes on and on. But the main thing is to remember that it's original archive uh, material generated by individuals and organizations um, related to Norfolk over the last you know, eight to 900 years or so. In contrast, or, or rather um, to complement that collection, the Norfolk Heritage Centre holds published material relating to the county. So obviously that's books and we have thousands and thousands of, of books related to the history of Norfolk. Um, but that also encompasses lots of other types of material that I think sometimes people are, are unaware that we hold. So that includes directories, uh, maps, plans, photographs, which we're obviously going to be concentrating on today, uh, but also prints, newspapers, sales catalogues, um, other uh, types of ephemera, so things like playbills, menus, kits, um, posters, that kind of thing. And then also we do hold uh, microfilm copies of um, some of the more frequently used um, records that are held in the original at the record office. So things like um, parish registers and, and other family history um, type of types of records. Um, but as it says at the bottom, the most important thing um, we, we have is our staff. So um, when you come up to the Heritage Centre on the second floor of the Millennium Library, you know, we have an inquiry desk there. Um, and please always remember that they are there to, uh, to do, do their best to, to find out what you, what you require of them. And there we go. That's the, Her the Heritage Centre in, in happier, happier times when we were open, the search room and the store there. That's behind the scenes. That's not a public area. That's the entrance to our stack because I just did want to give you a quick glimpse before we start with the first photographs um, relating to tonight's event of where most of these photographs actually live. And that's in this bay here, back in our stack. Um, we have two or three bays devoted to the photographic collections. Um, Norfolk Heritage Centre holds roughly, oh, what is it? Uh, about 200,000, 200,000 photographic images. Um, and that's not all, prints. You can see here we've got boxes and boxes of, of, of photographic uh, prints, uh, but we also hold things like um, uh, slides, uh, negatives, uh, carte de visite. Uh, we have about 200 phot photograph albums um, and also a handful of things, some of which are going to feature in the this evening's uh, presentation, uh, a handful of items that go, not a handful, quite a few items that date right back to the dawn of photography. So we have a number of daguerreotypes and also ambrotypes pin types um, and salted paper prints. So some, some examples of really, really early photography as well. And that brings us rather neatly to the first image in tonight's um, uh, presentation. Um, I'm gonna start this, uh, this, this, this event this evening. As Rachel says, we're basically, we're looking, the, the aim of the, of, the, of the evening is to consider women's experiences and lives over this period. So roughly 1855, 1860-ish, going up um, to, the, to the First World War, to, to 1914. And um, we're considering aspects of, 
of, of women's lives and experiences. So their, their lives and experiences um, inside and outside the home, um, thinking about the opportunities or lack thereof open to women at this time, the expectations uh, society had for them, um, the ways um, women responded to these expectations in terms of whether they tried to meet them or perhaps pushed against them in various ways. And of course, um, we're considering the ways in a very general way, um, all of these things perhaps changed over the period or not. Um, so it, it's very much a, a, a jumping off, off point for discussion rather than, a, you know, sort of a, a very hard and fast sort of uh, um, evening. Um, a a con concomitant effect of the, you know, a, a concomitant aim is obviously also to give increased no knowledge of our photographic um, collections. Um, and just to say at the outset as well, all of the collections, with the exception of one, which I will point to when we come to it, are drawn from the Picture Norfolk website. So I said earlier that we have 200,000 photographic items altogether, about 10%, so about 10, uh, sorry, about 20, 20 to 25,000 of those have been digitized. So you can see all but one of the photographs that I'm going to show you tonight on Picture Norfolk and many, many more besides. So if you're interested in, in a particular subject, particular aspect of Norfolk history, and you want to see if we have an image related to it, the first port, port, port of call certainly is to have a look on the, the Picture Norfolk website. And then if you can't find what you require, get in touch with us, of course, and we can, you know, we can have a look in our stack and, and ask you on if we can find something for you. So this first pho photograph, um, as you can see, is captioned. It's uh, a photograph of a lady called Hannah Bolding. Uh, it's the first of a, a number of photographs that I'm going to start off the, uh, the presentation this evening with, which are taken by a photographer called William Bolding. This is Hannah's brother. Now, William Bolding um, was an extraordinary chap, very interesting, um, talented man. Um, he was one of Norfolk's, um, well, in, indeed, one of the country's sort of pioneering amateur, gentleman amateur photographers, certainly one of the first sort of pioneering photographers in Norfolk. Um, he was from Weybourne and he was effectively um, Lord of the Manor at, at Weybourne. He was a large landowner, um, had his finger in a lot of pies. Um, he was a ship owner. Um, he, he was a merchant, uh, landowner, farmer, basically had a lot of um, varied sources of income, which allowed him to, um, to indulge his, his artistic pursuits. He's a very keen photographer, um, amateur artist, and generally involved himself in the, the artistic circles in Norfolk and, and the photographic circles of Norfolk at that time. Um, and he took some wonderful, wonderful photographs, um, primarily of his family um, and his, his, his immediate and extended family, but also his servants and other people who worked um, on his estate um, up, up on the Norfolk coast. And as I say, this is Hannah Bolding, his sister, and, this is taken, like many of the photographs, around about 1860. So it's, you know, reasonably, reasonably early. Um, Hannah um, was uh, William's uh, housekeeper. She never married. Um, and, um, you know, the role of a housekeeper, um, certainly not one um, to, be, to be thought of lightly in terms of the, the amount of hard work that would have been uh, required, obviously encompassed supervising of servants, generally running the, the household, um, making sure, you know, household um, supplies were well stocked and all that kind of thing. Um, but, of course, um, it was very much um, a domestic centred role. And this is, I suppose, one of the points that I want to sort of have, have, at the, have in, in the back of our minds as we look at, particularly at these early sort of photographs by, by Bolding. You know, this idea, very pertinent. Um, I'll just sort of continue, sort of go on. This, this one is Esther Bolding. This is this is William's mother. Um, and you can see this one also taken around about 18, 1860. Um, she looks like a fairly formidable, formidable lady, doesn't she? But um, yeah, with these early photographs, I just want to, as I say, ask you to sort of bear in mind this context of, of, of women's lives at this period. You know, obviously opportunities in terms of education, um, job opportunities, achievement in the wider world, um, very much um, restricted for women. Um, this is a period um, when, uh, you know, very much the ideology in the Victorian period is, is centred on this idea of kind of two, two spheres, the, the separate spheres that women uh, were expected 
um, to, to inhabit the one and men the other. So women very much expected um, to see their the, the domestic sphere as their, as their realm centered on the home, the hearth and family, leaving of course um, the public sphere of, of business and politics um, and uh, government and, and you know these public affairs as, as very much a male um, dominated realm. And I think just sort of having that at the back of the mind is, is quite interesting to consider when, when you sort of have a, have a look at some of these photographs. If we continue along, this one here um, is a nice image, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's uh, got a, obviously a bit of a prop there, but it shows Esther, Esther Monument, um, who was uh, William's uh, sister. Um, and she married um, William, William, William Monument, William Monument um, of Kings Lynn. Um, and you can see here Esther, Esther Monument, um, William Bolding, the photographer's sister with her eldest son. So we think this was taken around about similar, similar period again, maybe a bit earlier, circa 1855, um, showing her with her eldest son here in a, you know, sort of a typically sort of Victorian boyish pursuit of, um, I'm not entirely sure what it is. It looks like probably wood, perhaps wood turning. I'm I, you know, happy if anyone has any suggestions, but it does look like it could be sort of, you know, obviously a practical, um, pursuit that was, uh, you know, felt appropriate for a, a young male to, uh, to, to be occupied in at this time, which, you know, I think also speaks, speaks volumes, doesn't it, in terms of what um, expectations of, of different gender, gender roles was. It also speaks, I think, this photograph, um, again, in a, perhaps a, in a bit more detail about this idea of women's um, role and expectations in relation to, to being centred very much on the family. Um, at this time, you know, going through early to mid Victorian period, you know, there was more of a uh, an expectation that women would spend more time with their children. Um, you know, obviously, this is the age of empire. Um, young young males, and, and particularly being expected to be reared to, to go off and you know administer and fight overseas and what have you. And um, you know, motherhood at the centre of all that. Motherhood being you know the the, the, the real um, uh, manifestation of what was seen to be um, the ultimate, you know, validation effectively um, and fulfillment um, for for a woman. Um, here we go. This this is a this is the one. This is the one photograph uh, that does not come from Picture Norfolk. And um, I wanted a, a sort of a, a family photograph of the monuments. This is Esther, who, who we've just seen, obviously William William Bolding, the, the photographer's sister, with her husband. Um, and their children. So I'm dating this round about 1853, but this one, as I say, is not from Pitcher Norfolk. Um, this is from uh, the Kings Lynn Museum Holdings, as some of the other photographs we're, we're gonna see later on tonight are as well. Um, but this one actually I took straight from, straight from Twitter um, because I just thought it, it says quite a lot, doesn't it? For, the, for those of us who, who have, um, rem have, have, have current or past experience of, of having young children, I think we can all um, relate to that image to a certain extent. Um, Esther looks pretty tired. The children look pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, restless, I suppose. Um, it, it, that is sort of emphasized, isn't it? If you look closely on, on the right hand side, the, the child to the far right, obviously um, aided by the fact that it's, it's a, an early photograph and, and sort of exposure times of the period is, is blurred in the image. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a that's a photograph that, whilst uh, give us, giving us a little insight into into a, a Victorian family in terms of the the, the portrait, um, speaks speaks across <laughs> across the years um, in terms of uh, what having young children can uh, can feel and 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 look like. Um, this is a period, of course, also when you know Queen Victoria um, and uh, and Albert are, are having rather rather a lot of children. Um, Married in 1840, um, Victoria and Albert had nine children in 17 years. So this idea of, you know, motherhood and, and the family really being um, encouraged as being the centre uh, of the women's existence is, you know, it, it comes from the top. You know, it comes right down from um, you know, the symbolic um, role um, and, and actions of, of Queen Victoria, who was, of course, not very much not um, a fan of, of uh, 
uh, incipient uh, women's rights. You know, Queen, Queen Victoria was very, very actively um, discouraging of, of the sort of early um, movement towards women's rights. Um, this is uh, this is a very poignant image. Um, this one. Um, I should perhaps have uh, perhaps we should have given a little bit of warning about it. I, I don't think it's it's fairly macabre by modern sensibilities or by modern standards, but I don't actually think it's um, you know it's not a not a grotesque image. It's it's quite moving when you consider it. This this child um, has has died, um, and this is Esther Monument um, here, who we've just seen um, in the previous couple of images with her child, and the child is thought to be Sicily, Sicily Anne. Um, who was born in 1856 in August and then died on the 13th of January 1858. So clearly this is 18, dated from 1838. And it's an, it's a, an example of Victorian, um, what we refer to now as Victorian death photography, which is fairly, fairly self-explanatory. And um, so photography, I'm sure many of you, um, many of you will know, originated or, or was invented around about 18, late 1830s, early 1840s, um, uh, Fox Talbot in, in, uh, in, in Britain um, and uh, Louis Daguerre in, in France came up approximately the same time with, with the first photographic pro processes. You know, within, you know, first few years, 10, 20 years um, of this new medium, which obviously gained popularity as time went on and as, uh, photography became more and more accessible um, to a wider population and uh, to, to people with, uh, you know, perhaps who, who hadn't had access to it before. People within a culture, a Victorian culture, clearly as time went on as well, also um, influenced by, by Queen Victoria herself um, and the death of Albert. But this, this, this culture of, of mourning, of memento mori that was very prevalent in Victorian society at the time this is part of that so you know people saw photography as an opportunity of basically memorializing um, their children um, and their, their loved ones who, who had died um, in relation to women and women's experiences in society this also sort of overlaps with some interesting areas doesn't it um, in terms of family i mean uh, infant mortality um, this is a time when, when public health and uh, you know, amenities are gradually improving, yet at the same time, you do have instances of a terrible um, infant mortality, particularly in um, some of the larger and, and busier um, industrializing areas and urban areas. Um, and this was also um, another sort of source of, of uh, pressure upon women because it was felt by some that uh, you know, with mothers were to blame. You know why? Why are all these? You know why are all these young children dying? Um, clearly, it must be. You know there needs to be um, wider education in terms of um, you know practical uh, mothering skills and what have you. But um, you know, of course, in many instances, it was uh, simply a case of um, you know being being prey to prey to disease and uh, and wider public health um, uh, factors, as I say. Um, but yeah, a very poignant example. And as I say, you know. When you first sort of come across an image like this, and if you if you Google it, you know there are lots of interesting articles and lots of people discussed uh, Victorian um, uh, death death photography. It, initially, it's quite shocking, but actually, you know, when you consider it and you think about the context of the early, um, you know, originating of photography and, and the context of the time, um, you know, you can you can understand it, can't you? And, and my colleague Rachel actually, you know, when we discussed this um, a little while ago. You know, pointed out that you could make some interesting comparisons with some of the images which are um, shared, you know, nowadays, or, or sentiments which are shared on Instagram and what have you, in terms in relation to, um, you know, people suffering miscarriage and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, bereavement and, and what have you. Okay, if we move on, this obviously placed immediately after the um, foregoing image um, is quite poignant, um, but obviously uh, is a happier image and. Uh, I do like um, the cheeky, cheeky little smile on the uh, the face of the, the girl to the left of the image here. This is Mariette, as the caption says, Mariette and Beatrice. Um, so the, these are these are other daughters of Esther and William, um, around about 1860 again. And uh, one of the the girls there clearly holding a doll, 
which again I just think emphasizes you know right from the off right from the cradle um girls young girls it's being you know drilled into them very much what their role is what society's expectations um of them are and um yeah I just think particularly obviously coming off after the last photograph this is uh, quite a quite an evocative image um got a number of images featuring the these girls coming in the next uh, sort of round we've got another one here just of Beatrice which I just think you know, is really really nice uh, photograph of, of, of uh, William's uh, niece in a in a relaxed pose with her um with a wicker basket there in the garden in the garden and uh, a sort of a, almost a, an Alice in Wonderland kind of uh, kind of dress and uh, pose really Pictured um, a little later, around about 1865, we've again got um, uh, Beatrice, but uh, with, with her sister again, um, playing polo, as you can see, um, in, the, in the grounds of, uh, well, I'm not, not entirely sure where, where it is. It, it could be, it could be uh, the, the estate at uh, Weybourne, or it could be the, the monument family's uh, grounds. It's not detailed on the, um, on the photographs abstract, but um, yeah. Uh, Again, a nice, a, a nice photograph with, with some, you know, the, the polo accoutrements, which, which give it a, a bit of interest. Um, but you know, again, perhaps speaks to the, the kind of um, life that uh, the bounded, the bounded, if not restricted, the bounded expectations and, and, and life that um, women of this class, you know, domestic sphere, house and home leisure you know very nice girl playing polo but you know perhaps not not too many opportunities in the wider world beyond the beyond the grounds as it were similarly but um more of an indoor domestic uh, scene interesting photograph obviously you've got the use of the mirror here um bolding i think um you know makes interesting and and, and skillful use um of, of the mirror and the uh the, the pose with uh, one of the girls in, in profile there with the other brushing her hair. Practical application, of course, for, uh, for uh, early photographers at this time, quite often, you know, we'll be familiar with Victorian photographs of, of, of people um, with books, um, which, you know, in addition to um, suggesting um, the sitter's uh, intellectual um, and uh, literary um, interests and capabilities, um, had had the effect of giving them something to, to to concentrate and keep their hands still on and to, to keep generally still um, with because as we mentioned earlier you know exposure times at this period uh, for photographers um, meant that uh, you know keeping keeping sitters still was was very important if you didn't want a blurry photograph and uh, so you know these these uh, props are uh, potentially useful from from William's perspective in in that regard as well as being an interesting feature, then lending the photograph a bit more character. And again, another, a, a different example, we've got uh, the girls a bit older now playing chess. Um, a wonderful, um, as, as many of you will, will feel, I'm sure, you know, wonder, another wonderful aspect, excuse me, wonderful aspect of historic, historic photographs is of course the, um, the insights into fashion and dress um, and styles of clothing, which they, which they give, and, and that's another, um, you know, for any for any dressed historians among you, um, you know, this is another aspect of the, of the photographs that um, we're going to be going through today. That's that's of interest. Some wonderfully voluminous um, skirts on um, on display there. There we go. There's the pose with the book. So that's Esther again, um, a little bit later on. Um, again, William Bolding's sister. Um, pictured in profile standing and um, there we are back to Hannah so that's Hannah who we on the left hand side obviously is the photograph we we opened um, the, the the photographs the selection of photographs with um, and this is side by side with another um, image of Hannah um, 30 years later so uh, 1860 on the left hand side and then Hannah pictured again 30 years later in 1890 on the right and a nice echo as well um, with the earlier image of um, the sort of Alice in Wonderland-esque um, image of um, Beatrice I think it was wasn't it the young 
um, niece of, of William with her basket as well. Um, as we go through the, the, uh, the evening, go through the photographs, um, something that can't be, um, you know, separated from, from our considerations, as with any aspect of historical um, research and inquiry, is of course class. Um, and um, as it relates to women's experiences as well, of course, that's incredibly um, important. And this photograph sort of um, shines a bit of a light on that um, sort of uh, side of things, as it's uh, one of the uh, photographs that William Boulding took of his estate workers, or rather one of his, his, his uh, estate workers' wives. This is in fact the only photograph that I can find in, uh, in our collections on Picture Norfolk um, of uh, one of the servant class photographs as uh, um, being a woman. There are lots of photographs of um, chaps, hedge cutters, um, uh, agricultural labourers, farm workers, um, but this is the only one I could find of, of a woman. And as it says, it's um, simply entitled actually portrait of an unidentified woman. So she's not given a name, which to a certain extent, you know, you might, I mean, that could just be the way the cookie crumbled, but at the same time, you know, it sort of says something in itself, doesn't it? It's an un unidentified woman, but um, it's said to possibly the, be the wife of William Cook, who was, who was William Boulding's gardener. Um, we've got a, a precise date for this one, 1856. This is actually um, one of the, the portraits, um, I believe, that William Boulding actually exhibited um, in his lifetime. And there we have quite a famous image, actually, for those of you who are uh, sort of, you know, particularly interested in Norfolk history. Um, this, this image on the left is, is believed to be William Cook. Look at those hands, huge, huge bunched fists at the uh, resting on the... Uh, resting on his thigh there with his, uh, with his hat um, cl uh, clasped um, in, his, in his other hand. But uh, yeah, a, a, another wonderful, wonderful portrait. And a testament, you know, a real testament. I mean, William Bowling is not just, for those of you who are interested, you know, please do check it out. A, a, a chap wrote a book about Bowling a few years ago, copies of which we have in the Heritage Centre, which I'm sure you, you can find, um, you know, in, in all good bookshops. Um, try to remember the gentleman's name. I believe it was Jefferson. Jefferson uh, wrote a book on uh, William Boulding. Um, you know, it's not simply the case that he, he happened to be there at the period and he took lots of photographs. He's a really talented chap. You know, his, his portraits, he really does bring out um, a sense, I think, of people's personality um, and, and, and artistically, you know, emphasis on, on, on natural light. He had a, a purpose-built sort of adapted studio um in his in his property at Wayborn where he where he, he took his photographs and um you know as I say really really interesting uh, photographer and um produced some wonderful wonderful images which you can find many of them as I say on picture and author. Um, before we get to another little sort of uh related group I just wanted to sort of um slide this one in um this is an example of, of one of the photographs on picture Norfolk which has become the Norfolk Record Office holdings. So in the original, this is kept at Norfolk, um, Norfolk Record Office, and this, this comes from 1858. And as it says, um, it's a portrait of an uh, unidentified uh, woman um, with a mental illness. Um, the use of photography in relation to treating people with mental health um, problems um, is, is, is an interesting and, and quite extensive one. Um, in itself, particularly in you know this period, um, early early photography, mid Victorian period, and the chap who took this portrait, um, Hugh Welch Diamond, um, was very much at the forefront in terms of seeing how uh, phot photographs could be used um, in in the treatment of, of uh, mental health um, conditions. Um, of course, you know one has to be um, always aware of differences in terms of terminology and what that denotes. People wouldn't necessarily have um, use the kind of terms in relation to mental health as, as they would have been, as we would expect nowadays, you know, obviously um, the county lunatic asylums were being built as they were called at that time and uh, lunacy and, and madness would have been the, would have been the terms that many, many people would have used. Um, this one, as I say, taken by Hugh Welch Diamond, um, there, there, there are a number that he took, there are a number which are on picture Norfolk, which is similar, 
but this one I think is particularly um, haunting actually if you you know she stares out um, very um, poignantly I mean I'm sorry I keep using that word I should try and extend my vocabulary but you know with a, a very short um, hair um, staring straight on at the camera you know her shoulders fairly slumped um, but still you know still quite dignified I think you'll agree um, you know this is quite a quite a powerful powerful image I think um, Hugh Welsh Diamond um, we have a number of images of his in in the uh, photographic collections at the Heritage Centre as well as photographs held at the record office he went to Norwich School and was very friendly with a chap called Thomas Damant Eaton um, who was very much at the centre of the circle of photographers in Norwich in the 1850s um, and, and through, da through Damant Eaton you know he we, we, we know a lot more about the various photographers who are at work at this time in Norfolk and Norwich. Um, but yeah, Damon Eaton, um, sorry, Hugh Welsh Diamond, um, as I say, his connection to Nor Norfolk is that he went to Norwich School, um, very friendly with, with the, the circle of photographers in Norfolk at this time, particularly, particularly Thomas Damon Eaton, and then went to London, went to, went to Twickenham and uh, opened up. Um, he works, where did he work? Um, he was initially superintendent of the Surrey County Lunatic Asylum from 1848 to 1858, round about the time this photograph was taken, and then founded his own private um, asylum um, at Twickenham. But yeah, very, very interesting image. So I'm now, after that sort of brief interlude, I'm, I've now got a handful of images um, that are all taken by another chap who we have extensive um, examples of his work in the Heritage Centre. Um, and this is one of my favourites, really, really. I mean, Bolding is, is, is a, is a favourite of mine, but this, this chap is as well. And um, it sort of stands by way of, of contrast, if you like, to Bolding, because this is a photograph and the next um, handful of images are photographs by a chap called William Henry Finch. And I do try um, to, to, to um, work in references to Finch at, at any and every opportunity in, in events like this, because I really do think he's... A superb photographer and really really interesting um as i say he stands in contrast to um bolding for whereas bolding was very much um as i say one of these sort of gentleman amateurs um as i say he was a ship owner landowner um businessman lots of time lots of leisure time lots of money in which to pursue his um, photography and his other artistic interests by contrast finch was a working class chap um, born in the Norwich Yards. Um, when was he born? 1818. 1818, he was born, died in 1883. Um, and he was a working photographer. So this was his living. Um, and he had to make it pay. Uh, and this is something that comes out in the, in the phot photographs that he took. Um, he um, was born in Norwich, but actually went to live in Acol. Um, and the photographs that we have in the collections are mainly of Acol and the villages surrounding Acol, that area of um, the east of the county and the broads, um, going along up that coast and then moving in, sort of in a, in a bit of a sort of a triangle, converging on, on Norwich. He took some photographs of Norwich and, and some other areas dotted around as well, but mainly, as I say, um, the broads, sort of villages on the broads, around about Acol and towards Yarmouth as well. Um, but this one, as you can see, is Haymakers at Tunstall, Again, similar period to when Bolding was taking his, his photographs, but, but very different. Lots of people in the photograph, as you can say, as you can see, um, um, really naturalistic. You know, we've got um, people charging and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, cheer, sort of raising their, their mugs of, of well-earned, whatever it happens to be, beer or ale, I suspect, um, having uh, had a bit of a break from... Uh, uh, working on the land and, and you can see you know we've got um, two women on the side there on the right hand side with their um, implements looks like a, a scythe and a, and, a, and, a, and a big rake um, and then possibly another another lady on the um, on the ground sort of resting on the ground in the foreground to the left um, but clearly you know really interesting image um, I, I could I could talk about Finch for, for ages but you know, really important collection. We've got about 500 of his photographs of, of rural Norfolk life, really early, 1860s, um, in our collections. Um, and it's a nationally important collection. You know, there are 
um, similar collections in other um, repositories in the country, but none that are quite so early and that concentrate themselves in this way on a particular area, um, showing you know, rural life as it was lived at this period in time. As I say, um, this one here showing work as a wheelwright's shop um, at Hickling. Um, and um, again, you know, emphasizing that, uh, that Finch was a working photographer. And this, this sort of shows in the way that he has lots of people in the image. You know, he, he had a barrow, um, which he had his, which he kept his um, photographic equipment in. And he would literally walk, you know, the roads and the lanes around those village villages talking for business. And he'd come into a village and set up his camera and try and get people interested. And inevitably this meant that he would try and get as many people, you know, interest as many people as possible um, in, in his images with the hope of course of getting people to buy as many as, as possible and to tell um, as, as many people as possible about them. Um, but this one, again, as well as, as well as all of those considerations, the, the, the societal, um, you know, the insight into, into work and, and uh, class and, and uh, social history of the period. This one obviously showing how, how, how people are working together at a wheelwrights uh, with, a, with a couple of women in, the, in this shot. Uh, we've got a younger woman sort of third from the right um, there, sort of, sort of midway in terms of the, the plane of the image. And then an older, older lady on the left hand side. Um, so indicating, you know, thinking about, I referred to class and the implications of class earlier on. Um, you know, clearly this is a this is a different world from from Balding and, and his family. You know, this is this is women um, getting getting hands on in terms of the uh, you know the family business. Also, I think this photograph illustrates that not only is Balding um, really good in terms of the subjects that he chooses, and obviously that's related to a certain extent with his his um, you know his, his necessity in terms of. Getting, getting as much business as possible, but actually artistically, you know, really good at, um, at composition and, and making a really interesting image, you know, the way he's using the, um, the, uh, the various aspects of the wheelwright's shop, you know, the big wheel, um, all the tools, the way they're positioned, the way that he's positioned the, um, the workers within those, uh, within those implements as well, you know, really, really strong sort of compositional sense um, Finch had as well. Um, this is another one. This is another one by Finch. And I think this one actually, to a greater extent, shows um, that aspect that I was talking about in terms of gathering, you know, whoever happened to be around at the time. Um, this one shows Upton, um, the then um, new school um, at Upton, around about, again, this period, 1860. Um, and the main reason I show it in, in this selection is, of course, that school teaching is one of the very few areas that potentially offers an avenue for women to, to um, you know, go forward and develop in a, in a professional, professional context. Um, opportunities still restricted, you know, generally, and, and educational opportunities certainly limited, despite various um, signs of progress. There was an Education Act in 1870, um, opportunities for women to attend universities and what have you, and, and gain professional qualifications did start to become um, more um, possible um, towards the end of the 19th century, but generally, you know, opportunity is still very restricted. But as I say, school teaching is one of those areas where women could, could pursue a career potentially. Um, and I think you can see it looks to be, um, you know, just outside the door of the school there and in front, in the central center of the image, it looks as though you've got some of the staff there, um, very much in the background um, with these sort of um, slightly ragtag um, bunch of, of villages sort of uh, in the foreground of the image there. Again, just taken from a different angle, but with, with, with more of the, the, the school children, I think, at the front there. And then at the back, um, behind, um, on, a, on, on a plane of the image further back, just in front of the, the brickwork to the right hand side, presumably they, they are some of the, the teachers and the staff there pictured. Right. OK. Um, so, yeah, that's um, that's William Finch, a little uh, little uh, selection of, of, of images by Finch. Um, I'm now going to um, 
go through again another sort of handful of images, um, about seven or eight, I think. Um, they're all part of the Mitchell archive. As you've probably gathered by now, the Norfolk Heritage Centre very much has collections rather than a collection. So there are lots of very, there's lots of discrete sort of collections um, within the, the, the overall Heritage Centre collections. And one of these in respect of photographs um, is the Mitchell archive. So um, the Mitchell archive um, relates obviously to the, to the Mitchell family um, and um, is composed of uh, photographs which go right back to um, mid to late um, 19th century and go forward into the 20th century, um, showing various members of, this, of the Mitchell family from Norwich um, up until around about the 50s, 1950s. And this image here, um, this image here is a tin type, tin type photograph from around about 1894. And as you can see, it's fairly obviously a family portrait and it shows John and Lucretia Mitchell um, and their five children. And the, the particular children that I want you just to have a look at and uh, sort of mark in your mind's eye are Mary Elizabeth, who, um, sorry, no, excuse me, is first of all, Margaret, who's on the back left um, in the little sort of looks, looks to be straw hat, far left, left-hand side, sitting down there, excuse me. Um, and then um, Mary Elizabeth, who is front left in the large bonnet there. And then also Letitia, who is front right um, with the other wearing the bonnet um, there. So those three are gonna feature in the next few photographs, um, most of the next few photographs that I show you. Um, again, you know, another photograph which um, brings with it, um, you know, suggestions in relation to the ideas of, of family and hearth and these separate spheres in terms of the domestic and the public worlds that I mentioned earlier on. But also we have an unidentified woman, um, young woman sat on the right hand side at the back there, which who presumably we don't know, she's not named, but it very much does look as though she was um, a family servant of some kind, um, you know, possibly a, a nanny for the children or, you know, general, general sort of helper. And this is obviously Another area which is interesting in terms of thinking about women's experiences and lives at this time, because as I said, you know, we, we mentioned teaching, but other than that, um, you know, very few sort of professional um, career opportunities for women at this time, other than, of course, domestic service, uh, which was, was, was very, uh, you know, very much a, a path that, that women, um, before they were married, um, could pursue. Um, and, uh, you know, having, having a position with a family like this, you know, again, speaks to that idea of, of what a woman's um, role in society was expected to be. Just to mention as well, as I say, in terms of the materiality of this particular photograph, because, you know, I do, as well as sort of thinking about women's experiences in lives, um, as I said at the start, you know, I hope that you get a little bit of an insight just generally into the makeup of our photographic collections as well. You can see um, at the sides and at the bottom of this image, um, where the, the surface um, showing, showing the actual um, image has, has, has peeled away, showing the rusty, rusty metal um, underneath. And this is um, typical of, of, of how a, a tin type, um, you know, image uh, age, aged, you know, it's a, it's a cheap kind of photograph, um, accessible, um, but didn't last very long. It was pr prone to this kind of, um, you know, peeling. Um, and rusting. Um, but the advantage of that, of course, was of, of, of the solid um, metal backing is that it, you know, could be carried around very easily and, and wasn't as fragile as, as, other, um, as other photographic media. Tin types, actually, one of those um, were, were quite common, um, commonly uh, found, um, sorry, carried by soldiers in the, the American, um, American Civil War, you know, quite portable in that respect. Okay, so here we have Margaret, a bit younger. So, so this is this is moving back a bit in time. Um, so this is a few few years before that photo, uh, that family portrait was taken, that group portrait. This one taken around about 1890, and it shows Margaret um, and Letitia. Um, nice, nice little photograph, isn't it? Um, again, um, thinking in terms of dress. Nice, nice to see the images of, of the of the of uh, girls' dresses of the period and the hairstyles. Um, but yeah, just a, a nice, simple image of, of two 
um, of two sisters, which when we consider some of the photographs, you know, coming um, over, over the next, um, in the next selection, you know, it's nice to sort of bear this one in mind. Um, this one is an Ambro type. So another type of early um, photograph that we hold in the Heritage Center um, can be sort of mistake. They often come in sort of little leather cases, um, can be mistaken for tin types, um, can also be mistaken, mistaken for daguerreotypes as well. They're, they're a negative image um, on glass, which is then backed by a solid surface so that in the reflected light, the image shows positive. Um, as I say, can be mistaken for daguerreotypes, which um, this is an example of here. This, this is not from the Mitchell archive and doesn't show a, a member of the Mitchell family, but I've just slotted this one just to sort of make that um, comparison with, with Ambro types and Tim types. Um, daguerreotypes, we, they're wonderful, magical thing. Um, and we have, I think we have about 10 or 11 of them um, in the Heritage Centre collection. We, we can't really get them out, um, except on very, very rare occasions. That, and even then we have to do it within the store when we do behind the scenes um, or in, in the stack, because they're very, very sensitive. Um, daguerreotypes, like Ambro types, like potentially sometimes tin types, come in a, in a sort of a closed little case made of leather, which sort of emphasizes the sort of precious object um, aspect um, of them. And they are wonderful, sort of they have this wonderful sort of jewel, gem-like quality. Um, so that they can be colored as, as this one is, um, and you have to sort of hold them correctly, hold them at the right angle in order for the sort of quite ghostly seeming image to, to, to come out at you. Um, this is what the difference is between a, a daguerreotype and, a, and an Ambro type. Um, sometimes um, people will think they've got a daguerreotype and daguerreotypes are quite rare, um, quite precious and, 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 and quite, quite expensive. Um, and uh, quite often people can be disappointed to learn that they actually have an Ambro type. And the difference between them, if you happen to find one in a car boot sale and you suspect it's a daguerreotype, the key is, to, as I say, to sort of do this play in terms of moving and shifting it around in your hand, look at the angle of it, because if it's a daguerreotype, as I say, the image will only show at a certain point when you hold it at the correct angle. When you then move it and rotate it, um, through through degrees, it will sort of disappear. Whereas an Ambro type and and indeed a tin type, um, you know, you you can you can move it around, um, rotate the angle, and it you know the image just stays stays put. This one, um, just just to mention as well, this this image is actually Sophia or Sophia Hind, um, uh, Hind um, the, uh, was married. To, sorry, excuse me, was married to Francis Hind. Um, whose, whose father um, established um, the uh, Saint, um, sorry, bear with me a moment, the Saint Mary's, Saint Mary's Silk Mills in Norwich in 1810. So this is one of the great and good um, of Norwich um, in the, in the mid-Victorian mid period. Um, and of course it would only have been, you know, like, likely to have been that, that strata of society who would, who would have been, um, you know, taking daguerreotypes of themselves. Okay, back to the Mitchells, back to the Mitchell archive. And this is a nice image, isn't it? This one is Letitia. Uh, this one taken around about 1900. So we're moving, moving back, sorry, moving forward again um, in time. She's obviously quite a, quite a bit older. She's got this wonderful sort of um, spreading um, skirt with these sort of mutton, mutton sleeves, um, holding a book, um, lent on the table there and looking very um, sort of... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Determinedly off into the into the middle distance there. Um, Letitia went on to become a teacher. Talking about teaching earlier, being a, you know one of the uh, professions more more accessible to, to women, um, Letitia followed that path. So to a certain extent, perhaps this is uh, presaged um, you know in in this image not only with the uh, determined and uh, uh, intellectual sort of look expression, but also the you know the book held held in the left hand as well, but yeah, really really nice some um, nice photograph showing a lot of character coming through. This one again is a is another another Ambro type, and again this is uh, Letitia. So we moved on about ten years or so 
Um, and isn't this marvelous? Um, you know, the bicycle um, became more and more popular as the Victorian era um, merged into the Edwardian. And, um, you know, there is, there's been heaps written on, um, you know, the, the, the implications for the popularity of the bicycle in terms of, um, uh, you know, social, literal and, and metaphorical social mobility in terms of classes, but also, of course, in terms of um, women's experiences um, and uh, giving, giving women the opportunity to, to literally get, get around and get out and about and, uh, and uh, you know, broaden, broaden the horizons and, and experience the freedom of, and the mobility that, uh, that the uh, more, more sort of uh, accessible and, and safer um, bicycle afforded them. Um, so we do have, I'm going to, I'll, I'll um, include, you'll, you'll see another one a bit later on, but um, we do have a number of photographs in, on Pitchfork and in the wider Heritage Centre collections of, of women standing very proudly posing with their, with their bicycles. So clearly, you know, this is not something that was lost on, you know, the, the, this idea that women were conscious of, of you know, the, the, um, the advantages that, that getting, getting mobile with, with a bicycle afforded them. And this image as well, I think, you know, in terms of fashion and style and, and the dress of the period, you know, speaks to um, changing times. You know, this 1910 round about this one. So by this time, uh, the suffrage suffrage movement is really starting to, to gather gather head and gather steam. As I say, Letitia was a was a teacher, so um, you know, one can imagine that she she was a woman of uh, forward thinking and enlightened opinions and. Uh, you know, this is something that I think is certainly comes through um, in this this wonderful image. The other girl that we, we haven't mentioned so much so far, but we did mention her on the original Mitchell portrait, family group portrait is, is here. So this is Mary Elizabeth. And again, like her sister Letitia, she she followed that um, that path of becoming a teacher. Um, and uh, as you can see, taught um, at Wellney, the, the little girl in the central of the center of this um, class um, photograph, holding up the little little uh, blackboard that you can see identifies the, uh, the school as being Wellney. Um, and of course, we've got the date, um, 19, I believe it's 1909. Yes, it is 1909. Um, so yeah, in, in manifesting itself in a very obvious way there, um, a, a, a top tip, and the, the, at the core of all efforts to uh, identify um, uh, the date of historic photographs, look for any obvious clues <laughs> within the image, and uh, this this certainly is a is a good example um, a good example of that. But um, you know, again, just a nice nice photograph exemplifying that that um, aspect of, of uh, professional opportunity for, for women at this time. And this one taken in 1909, so around about the same time as, as the previous photograph of, of Mary's sister, Letitia, with her bike. Um, I really love this photograph. Um, this is, uh, again, Margaret and Letitia um, in fancy dress, effectively. Um, so this just shows, um, shows the two sisters um, together in a, in a lighter moment. Um, um, dressed as uh, um, in a in a sort of a an oriental um, fashion again round about 1910 but um, yeah just speaks to um, sisterhood and uh, camaraderie and uh, having uh, having a bit of a, a fun time this one the next photograph here I suppose strictly speaking when you consider the um, the remit of this uh, this, this uh, event this evening doesn't really fit in terms of date because it's taken around about 1930. Um, but I had to include it in, in this one for, for obvious reasons. It obviously fits with the, um, the little selection from the Mitchell archive um, and just shows, you know, some of those, some of the women, a couple of the women, um, Letitia and Mary um, in later life, um, together with their nephew, Derek James Mitchell, who was born in 1920. Um, they're pictured here at Hun Stanton. Um, again, you know, I mentioned before the, the changing dress and style and fashion that you're always going to, um, you know, notice when, when considering a selection of um, photographs over time. But, um, you know, again, this, this one particularly sort of is nice in that regard because we've got the nice sort of uh, 
19, uh, 1920s, 30s style sort of hat there, sort of posh sort of hat style there. And, um, you know, the women, both of them having had careers in, in teaching, um, both of them, I should say as well, incidentally, didn't, um, didn't marry, but um, clearly had, had rewarding, um, rewarding jobs as, as, as teachers. But yeah, nice to see a, a picture of, the, of, uh, of Letitia and Mary in, in later life together. Right, so that, that ends our little mini selection of Mitchell archive images. I'm just gonna, just wanted to slip this one at the opening of another little batch now um, of women um, sort of just sort of at leisure really through this period, you know, images of recreation um, and leisure. And this one is of a whip of a woman's brass band, and it's taken at Acle, and it's got lots of people in it. So who can tell me who's taken this image, this photograph? I'm not going to expect it. You don't have to have to say, but I hope you're all you're you're all saying in your in your mind or at your screen, William Finch, because it, yes, of course, it is. It's an example of the superb um, William Finch's work, um, and this shows. Um, a location which many of you may well be familiar with because it's there to this day, the King's Head um, Inn at Acle. And it hasn't really changed very much, as you can see, um, since uh, 1865. And this shows um, an all female brass band um, at Acle, um, round about 1865. Um, all, fe all female brass bands were quite rare. At this period of around about 20,000 brass bands um, recorded in, in Britain um, since 1800, less than 30 were known to be all women brass bands. And this, by the looks of things, appears to have been um, one of them. Um, as a, and, you know, again, this, this, this uh, image um, exemplifies that aspect of Finch's work, which I remarked upon earlier in terms of, you know, bringing everyone um, who, who happened to be in the general vicinity into the into the photograph to be included? You can see someone um, on his on a appears to be on a donkey in the middle of the image with, with various other um, onlookers, including children, men, and, and older people in the in the doorway and of the of the pub. And you can see also we've got what appears to be a little girl um, in the upstairs window, um, looking down from the king's head as as, as well. Okay, please just excuse me one moment while I put the light on because I'm getting a bit um, getting a bit dim in this room. I can't read my notes. Just give me one second. Right. Okay. Um, this one here, I said earlier at the start of the uh, the session that um, we have a number of photograph albums in the Heritage Center collection. We have about two hundred altogether, um, and this is from uh, one of those. Um, is from one of the albums that we have. Um, which picture the, the Harvard um, family um, of Gunton, um, an upper class family. So again, that's something to, to bear in mind in, in terms of um, the way we're viewing these images this, e uh, this evening. Um, but clearly this is, shows a woman angling um, round, about, round about 1890. Um, and yeah, very, very sort of nicely turned out, you know, woman with a, with a hat and a, and her gloves, um, again, interesting from a from a clothing history point of view. But also, I just thought, you know, not necessarily, not necessarily an occupation that one would expect to find a you know um, a woman doing at this period. Um, but you know, interesting to see you know a woman getting stuck in it, stuck into a bit of fishing uh, at this at this time. Um, continuing on the theme of uh, leisure recreation. Um, and, and also harking back to that, what I said earlier, um, we've got a woman here with her bicycle. Um, and as, as, as I said earlier, very proudly, um, obviously next to her, her bike, this particular woman, um, this one um, is from the Taylor collection, um, was taken at Kings Lynn. Um, the Taylor collection of photographs that we hold dates mainly from 1890 um, up until 1900. Um, and shows um, Lynn and the wider West Norfolk area, um, along with the Taylor family um, and their friends. Uh, we're not entirely sure who, who the, what the precise identity of the photographer of the Taylor collection. We, we 
you know, we, we, at least at least one person, obviously, in the family um, was a photographer, but primarily the tailors were actually um, seed merchants. Uh, there was a they ran a seed merchant shop in Kings Lynn, um, and the business was first established in 1770. But there is an extensive collection um, relating to the tailors, and that encompasses glass negatives, lantern slides, as well as prints. Um, and they are actually kept, the physical, um, the physical uh, items are kept as part of the King's Lynn um, Library holdings. This is another one um, from the Taylor collection um, at Denver, um, in the, not, not far from King's Lynn. Um, and this is a corking photograph, isn't it? Really, really good. Um, we've got um, a number of women included, obviously, you can see one, two, three, four, five, um, in a very relaxed, relaxed pose. Um, the, the, the woman to the, to, in the center, to the, slightly to the left, looking wonderfully regal um, with her photograph, uh, sorry, with her, her cigarette um, between her fingers and sort of gazing off, excuse me, gazing off to the sort of um, right-hand side as we, as we look at the image. But um, yeah, a really nice photograph, which I think, you know, points to something, doesn't it, in terms of, the way we think about relations between the sexes at this time. Um, you know, uh, I think this is again something that one has to, to bear in mind class very much. Uh, these are sort of middle and upper middle class um, women. So um, perhaps, uh, you know, just ha ha having, a, having a, a jolly sort of picnic in the, in the country with, with male friends was, was not, was something that was seen as rather more um, acceptable amongst this, this class of, uh, class of person than perhaps uh, those of those lower lower down the social order or indeed perhaps higher in the social order um, as well but um, smoking of course also something else that um, became more and more um, uh, seen um, generally but you know, certainly obviously uh, smoking by women and that's obviously exemplified in this in this photograph but um, yeah a nice nice photograph of um, a relaxed um, group of people um, at this at this period in time, right about the 1890s. I'm going to have a few more photographs. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're OK. Um, a few more photographs, which. Um, uh, which um, relate to this theme of women at leisure and, and enjoying various um, aspects of recreation. Um, and then I'm going to round round up with a, with a series of images relating to women and work um, at this period. But. Before we get to the to the work images, we've got one or two more um, relating to leisure and, and uh, sort of relaxation. And this is obviously women, um, as it says, with bathing machines at Great Yarmouth, 1898. This one was taken. And as you can see, um, women's beachwear has uh, has developed rather a lot since um, since 1898. Um, women obviously expected not only were they expected to, to cover up um, extensively in terms of their bathing costumes, but they were, of course, as indeed, of course, men were um, expected to make use of the uh, of the bathing machines, which would um, preclude um, anyone getting a um, getting a naughty glimpse of of ankle or uh, or what have you. Um, but yeah, you know, quite quite amusing from from our modern perspective. But again, one of those things that has serious um, undertones to it in terms of uh, you know thinking about the way. Um, women's bodies were um, treated and expected to be presented um, at this at this time. This one, as you can see, it's called Blakeney at the Fair, and the fact that it's titled in, in um, sort of enclosed in quote marks, it's got a sort of a definite title to it: Blakeney at the Fair, nineteen ten. Gives a bit of a clue in terms of the attentions of the photographer, um, because this one's taken by Walter Clutterbuck, and uh, Walter Clutterbuck again, um, just like William Bolding, just like uh, William Finch, is very much one of the top um, early photographers um, in the Heritage Centre collections. Um, he was a bit later. Um, he was born in 1853, died in 1937, and he wasn't actually from Norfolk. Um, he was, was from a wealthy Surrey family, but spent much of his life um, when not traveling. He was, he was a big traveler, went around around the world taking taking photographs. Um, but when he wasn't traveling, he, he based much of his time in Norfolk 
um, at North Reps um, and also uh, Marsham Hall. Um, Clutterbuck, as you can probably gather from this photograph, was more interested in uh, creating, um, creating a photograph as a work of art. Um, where, I mean, I think certainly, as, as, I've, as I've already suggested, you could certainly claim um, artistic merit for um, both Bolding and, and Finch's images, actually. Um, with, with Clutterbuck, it, that is certainly more to the fore um, in terms of uh, his image uh, making. And he was very interested in um, sort of the treatment and what you could do with, with um, various techniques and uh, technical um, processes in terms of producing his photographs at this time. And you get a sense of that from this image here. You can see it's got a sort of a, a pastely, um, grainy texture, which, um, you know, isn't, isn't ideally um, captured by looking at a screen like this. I mean, you really get that effect when you, you, you're able to see these photographs um, in, in real life. But I think, as I say, you do get a sense of it. You can see the graininess and that sort of pastel effect, as well as the sort of, you know, the, the artistic composition. Um, but yeah, this one um, is from uh, a particular album uh, showing uh, photographs of Blakeney and the, the surrounding area um, of this period, 1910. Um, but the Heritage Centre holds um, the main body of work for, for Clutterbuck. So we've got about, well, we've got 30, we've got precisely, I've got it in my notes here, 35 albums and 48 exhibition prints produced by Walter Clutterbuck. And the albums are a record um, of, of home life, but also travel, including visits to Norway, Brittany, Tenerife, Saint-Tropez, Japan, Dalmatia, Belgium and India. So, you know, really interesting from a, you know, geographical and, and social history, um, you know, in, not just interesting from a local studies angle, is, is what I'm trying to say. So um, this is the sort of final well, it sort of it, it overlaps the two boundaries to a certain extent, doesn't it? This one because this one shows um, female employees at Coleman's of Norwich, and I'm sure many of you, particularly those of you um, in Norwich, will recognise um, the uh, the uh, the aspect of the photograph um, that looks to be Trous, um, and obviously being Coleman's employees, um, you know, it's, that's that, that 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 fits, doesn't it? Because uh, as I'm sure many of you will know. Um, Trow, the, the cottages and much of the um, development at Trous was um, built um, by the Coleman family for um, the benefit of their employees. And we can see them in the background there. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the ground, the playing field at Trous and the cottages surrounding it very much nowadays, as you see, see them there. Um, but as I say, this is, this is from 1912 and shows Coleman's employees. Uh, women, women employees just having fun playing a bit of uh, a bit of netball there, as you can see. And uh, I suspect this um, this image, well, 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 I know for definite, actually, this image is from a large collection, of large negative um, associated with Coleman of Norwich, um, and the majority um, of the images were intended, probably, for the firm's um, quarterly staff publication, the Carrow Works magazine. Um, and the Carrow Works magazine, really, really interesting. Um, resource actually if you're interested in um, Norwich's industrial um, heritage and employee um, employee uh, employer relations and industrial relations and workers uh, recreation and all this sort of thing that they're a really interesting resource that we have um, at the Heritage Centre. Okay we've got about 15-20 minutes left so I'm going to whip through about seven or eight photographs here um, at the finish here, which relate in different ways to women and work um, across the country, county. So this one is taken by another very, very eminent, perhaps the mo most eminent um, photographer in terms of um, international reputation that we have um, the work of. And that, of course, is uh, P.H. Emerson. Um, Emerson is, is internationally recognised as, as an important um, pioneering photographer and writer on um, the development of, of photography. Um, P. H. Emerson was born in 1856, so um, born at a similar time to Clutterbuck. Um, died in 1936 and produced a number of photographic books, um, for which he's probably um, best known. This one comes from an example um, of those, um, and the the particular image 
um, is as it as you can see called osier. I'm not sure how you pronounce this. I should have learned it, shouldn't I? Osier or osier peeling from 1888 um, shows a girl peeling osiers for basket making. Um, apparently, I, I don't profess to know anything about osiers or peeling osiers, so I'm just going to read this brief extract from the um, from the abstract of the photograph. Osiers were grown in small patches on marshland near the broads and harvested in April. The upright post was known as a brake. It had a sharp blade at the base of the opening which split the osier into the heel and the rod when it was pulled through sharply. Women and girls were commonly paid to do this work. This process is described in pictures of East Anglian life. Um, so that's the, the particular album that, um, that Emerson published uh, this photograph in. We have a number of examples of, of, of Emerson's um, albums and photographs um, in the Heritage Centre, which you're able to, to look at. Um, when we are again, as, as we all hope, um, as soon as that is, is possible, when we are again open for, for public um, visits. This next one, as it says, shows Mrs. Harriet Fox, the postmistress at Cromer, around about 1900. Miss Fox, presumably the uh, lady in the centre, um, the older lady in a, in a sort of black um, dress there. I presume that's Miss, Miss Fox. That looks to be Miss Fox. Um, Harriet Fox was the uh, widow of John Fox. So John Fox had originally been the postmaster of Woodford House, Jetty Street, Cromer, and he died in 1888. And then his wife, Harriet, um, became the postmistress um, at the newly built general post office at Church Street. So uh, being a postmistress, as, as all of you who have read um, uh, uh, or, or seen Lark Rise to Candleford will remember, um, was another occupation in which um, women um, could progress. Um, and as you can see, had, had rather, as in this instance, had, had rather a lot of staff, um, including a very, num a very great number of men um, under, under her uh, auspices, um, got lots of mustachioed um, postmen standing at the back, very fine looking, um, as well as other um, members of the post office and the, uh, the post, excuse me, the sort of lads, the boys pictured, um, pictured sitting down uh, with cross legs at the front there. Um, interestingly, we've, we've got the detail on the abstract of the photograph here. Um, the salary for uh, Miss, Miss Fox's salary was believed to be um, uh, two, no, I'm not going to read that actually because it's unclear. I apologise. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, but we know that she retired in 1904. She retired in 1904 and then lived on a number of years to die at a, at a great age in the 1930s. So this particular image forms part of the Crawford Holden collection and is held at Cromer, Cromer Museum. But as, as with all but that, that other um, Bolding family image, um, as with all the other images, you can find this on the security. This one, um, um, I haven't got a huge amount to say about it. it. It sort of speaks for itself, really. It's just an interesting image of women at work, isn't it? It gives an insight into one of the kind of occupations that uh, women in, in the rural parts of the county um, were obviously um, involved in and, and shows workers at Litcham. Litcham lime kilns getting stuck in um, around about 1900 to. Uh, to to work there uh, with the lime kilns. I'm not quite sure um, what uh, what part the uh, the donkey played in the uh, in the work there. That's that's pictured. Possibly uh, turning, turning. I, it could be, couldn't it? Could be attached to that sort of um, big um, sort of uh, apparatus that's within that tub there. Maybe it's. Uh, I don't know. I'm betraying my ignorance. But um, a, a, an interesting and a, and a good quality image of, of workers at the lime kilns um, there. This one, just to sort of continue that sort of theme of, of rural work um, in the county. Um, this one is not from the Taylor collection, but does show um, uh, work workers in the Kingsland area. This one, this one um, is from the um, Bowskill, Bowskill collection. So this one is another one that is part of the Kingsland Library holdings. Um, as I say, from the Bowskill skill collection, which comprises over 400 glass negatives and were made by the chemist and photographer Henry Logsdale. 
between 1900 and 1910. They show the Kings Lynn area, including local shop, shopkeepers, craftsmen, buildings and events. And in this instance, as you can see, strawberry pickers in the, um, in the Kings Lynn area. Um, agricultural work, um, as it continues to be, but obviously much more so, um, you know, back um, in, in, in years, years gone by was, was obviously a, a key, key industry for Norfolk um, and women, um, as we've already seen in some of the other, other photographs, you know, played, played an important role in this. And this is demonstrated in this um, rather nice image, which, you know, tellingly as well, I don't know, you know, put your own spin on this, but we've got um, a, a young chap um, pictured in the front and another one at the side, I think with the basket, but another, um, a, another male standing at the back, sort of um, in a very prominent position, which kind of gives a little bit of an indication of, uh, I think, um, the balance of uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of power relations and employee and employer relations, possibly, possibly there. We don't, I'm not entirely sure about that, but um, you could, you could read that into it, couldn't you? This is another one um, of Coleman's um, Coleman's workers. This one, rather contrasting with the, the previous photograph of the the, uh, the women playing netball at Trous. This one is, shows women actually at work um, packing tins of mustard at Coleman's um, in 1908. Um, really nice photograph. This one actually, I think, isn't it? It's um, you know sort of feels a little bit almost ahead of its time. I think this one doesn't it? It's sort of really nicely composed with the you know the the production line receding um, back into the distance. Um, the effect of that sort of emphasised and giving given the sort of a bit more of a heightening by the um, the the position of the uh, the sort of light bulbs overhead. I think it's quite nice as well the way they they track the production. I mean, obviously they're there because of the production line, but you know photographically, I think it's it works um, with the, the sort of uh, the work of the beams and the cross beams, what have you, at the top. Um, and then you've got, of course, the um, the Coleman's mustard tins um, right at the front of the uh, in the foreground of the image. Very clear to see, and the, the women hard at work uh, with a, presumably a, an older sort of female um, supervisor um, on the other side of the bench on the right hand side going back. Um, yeah, I suspect again this is um, one of those images like the one of the workers um, playing netball at Trous that was intended for the for the Carrow Works magazine because it feels a little bit as I say very um creatively and uh, adeptly um but does feel slightly sort of managed doesn't it it's a bit a bit staged um okay only a couple more to go um but yeah just another another just another couple um relating to women at work and this one again at King's Lynn um showing workers at the bow or bow Bow brand. I'll say bow. I think bow is the bow brand. Excuse me. It's obviously bow because they're the bow brand British gut factory, and the bow brand British gut factory um, still exists. You can you can Google them and find them on their website, and they're very proud of their heritage. Actually, um, as a lot of brands are, uh, the bow brand British gut factory, and they've got a bit on their website about their history. Um, but we've got a number of photographs actually. If you put bow brand or bow brand gut factory into the picture Norfolk search. Um, bar, you will come up with a number of interesting photographs of this, of which this is one, and it shows clearly um, workers um, sorting and grading and measuring gut, which would have been used and which continues to be used um, for for things like musical for musical instruments, um, basically. So um, yeah, not not a pleasant <laughs> from from some perspectives, not a pleasant task, but um, one which clearly is. Um, an avenue at this time, 1910, starting, you know, obviously industrial revolution happening in the years and the decades and century preceding this, but things starting to become more industrialized, more production line oriented. And, um, you know, this is, this is seen a little bit in, the, in this photograph from 1910. And the penultimate, penultimate photograph of the evening here um, we've got many many wonderful photographs in our collections of um, the fishing industry at Yarmouth and particularly um, particularly we have wonderful photographs 
of the, the women workers who worked um, in the processing of the herring in the, the herring industry at Yarmouth. Um, this one is from 1912. So it takes us right, right up until our sort of the period where we're, we're ending up. Um, but we've got photographs showing similar scenes from 1870, 1880-ish. As you will see, if, and I hope you do, um, attend the next in our series, um, in the following follow on session to this, where we're looking at photographs from 19, um, from 1914 to 1939, um, We've got photographs of similar scenes that go right up to the 1930s. Uh, and the, the, the herring girls, as they have been called, the Scotch, very often from Scotland, um, they're referred to as the Scotch herring girls, would come down season, seasonally to, to assist uh, and work at Yarmouth, getting stuck into what is clearly, you know, a tough, tough old job, um, you know, literally getting their hands stuck into the, into the herring barrels there and scaling them and generally packing and processing them. But really nice photographs. Lots of them are really good, actually. I mean, you know, if you've got if you've got an hour to kill, I mean, you know, <laughs> if you've got an hour to kill, yeah, have a look at pictures of, of herring workers in Yarmouth on Pitcher Norfolk, because they are, you know, they're really nice photographs. But as as with this one, they very often really do capture a sense of the, you know, the comradeship and the camaraderie that these these female workers clearly um, clearly experienced amongst themselves. And I do like this one, you know, you can see that the woman in the center of the image focus looking up, you know, glancing directly at the camera, but, you know, still at her work with the woman behind her, um, you know, attending to her hair. Um, and um, yeah, I suspect they, it was uh, quite a, quite enlivening, enlivening company as you were, as you were working on the, at the dock side there. So this brings us um, to the final image of the of the evening and um this one i don't think actually i don't i don't think this one is out on pitch norfolk i think this is one other one that actually isn't on pitch norfolk so i apologize for that um but it's a really really lovely image and it was discovered by our wonderful colleague claire claire everett if you have any you know drop us a line at the heritage center if, if today um or has has figured any sort of ideas or interest or, or, or avenues of research that you're interested in following up. As, a, as I can't emphasize enough, you know, do drop us a line at the Heritage Center and uh, you know, we will get back to you. But if you've got something particularly in depth, um, it's likely that our wonderful Picture Norfolk coordinator, Claire, Claire Everett will, will be the person to get back to you. Um, and she discovered this in her researches um, a couple of years ago now um and put it on twitter um and it went mad on twitter it, it really it was disseminated far and wide and it was very popular um because as you can possibly work out this shows a suffragette meeting um so we've got three suffragettes at the bottom of the image there with a crowd gathered around them um so this is taken around about 1912 we think 1911 just before the outbreak of first world war um, the suffrage movement has, uh, you know, really massively, you know, gathered gathered pace. Um, as we will go on to to find in the next um, in the next session, um, the First World War has a huge impact. Excuse me, in relation to to women's rights, and we'll go on and talk about that in the in the next session. But um, a lot of progress in terms of raising public consciousness of women's rights has been made by the start of the First World War. And uh, many of them, uh, many of, you know, many prominent Norwich and Norfolk women are, are involving themselves in the suffrage movement. We don't know the precise identities of these women speaking, um, but we do get a sense, I think you'll agree, of the general clamour and the, um, you know, the sheer, um, the sheer, you know, sort of courage to, to get up and, and, and put their point across. Um, you can see where this is clearly, um, you can see where this is taken. Um, in the background there, you've got the, I forget the name, but you've got the, uh, the sort of uh, 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 the street which leads to the castle, to Castle Meadow, um, and what is Bonza's stores there in this photograph. Um, used to be, um, used to be lush, didn't it? The soap, soap um, shop, and is now, I believe, a, a, a posh chocolate shop, I think, isn't it? Selling, 
selling Mexican chocolate and stuff. But um, I'm sure many of you can, can recognize um, uh, the, the, the place in, in the city center there uh, where it is. Uh, you may be uh, slightly discom discombobulated by the, the statue because the statue pictured there um, is actually, as I'm sure many of you will, will know, um, the statue of Wellington, which is now in the um, cathedral gardens and um, sort of complements the, uh, the similar statue of, of Nelson, which is in the cathedral gardens. But at this time, it was positioned there sort of at the bottom of the, of the marketplace um, in the city centre. So um, that brings us to the end. Um, if any of you have any questions now, please do, you know, don't, don't hesitate just to, to ask them if you wish or put them in the chat. Um, but uh, other than that, as I say, don't hesitate to, to get in touch with us if, uh, if you have any, any further questions emerge, uh, sort of uh, occur to you in the, in the coming days, weeks and months. And um, yeah, other than that, thank you very much for, uh, for attending this evening. And I hope, I hope you will um, join us for the, for the following sessions, which details of which I'm sure Rachel will, will put in the chat. Thank you very much. <laughs>